God. Amen. No have faith in me. I don't know. Okay, I can't tell it's uh, day or night, but have faith in the Lord. <clears throat> Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the way you have trod. Never alone are the least of his children. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Have faith in God when your prayers are unanswered. Your earnest plea he will never forget. Wait on the Lord, trust his word, and be patient. Have faith in God, he'll answer yet. Have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Have faith in God in your pain and your sorrow. His heart is touched with your grief and despair. Cast all your cares and your burdens upon him and leave them there. Oh, leave them there. <laughs> Have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Have faith in God, though all else fell about you. Have faith in God, he provides for his own. He cannot fail, though all kingdoms shall perish. He rules, he reigns upon his throne. Have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Amen. <clears throat> the next song we'll be singing tonight is called My Lord Knows the Way Through the Wilderness. I know this song a little bit, so I'm going to need you guys' help with this song. Uh, My Lord Knows the Way Through the Wilderness. <laughs> My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. Strength for today is mine all the way. And all I need for tomorrow, my Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. One more time. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. Strength for today is mine all the way. And all I need for tomorrow, my Lord knows the way through the wilderness. 
All I have to do is follow. All right, good singing. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. That was a good singing. I love that song, Have Faith in God. And it's uh, such a simple thing. And I was, uh, took my wife and son to the airport this morning. And I was watching a, a video, about, a YouTube video that somebody was, uh, some commentators about faith and just faith in general. And, uh, you know, what a, what a difference it makes when you have a faith that um, the, uh, one of the um, speakers in the, in the YouTube video was a, was a Christian and one of them was just a, more of a spiritual, just a, you know, belief in faith in, in the vaguest sense, but, you know, what a difference it makes in, in the lives when you have something firm like we do to have faith in, that we have faith in God. And the, uh, the Christian was making that how um, when things get dark and things get, um, depressing and sad and uh, weary, you know that you're never alone when you have faith in God and that you know that there's always going to be uh, somebody there to help you and, and see you through through these times and that you will have, have God with you. And the, the Christian that YouTube video is making, you know, that's a, there's, a, there's a reason, you know, why uh, Jesus Christ said he's going to send a comforter. You know, if things are going to be nice and happy and sunshine and lollipops and rainbows, you would need a comforter. You don't need a comforter. Uh, when things are good, you need to comfort her when things are bad. And um, I don't know about you, but these these last couple of years with COVID and just things going on this year, there's there's a lot of uh, reasons we need to have a comforter. And uh, I am so thankful that uh, we can have faith in God and that He does know the way through the wilderness. And um, man, just what a what a great song that is. I'm so thankful for these these hymns that have truths in them. Um, just so good. Turn your Bibles to First Peter chapter two. We're continuing our look at First Peter, First uh, Peter chapter two. Uh, continuing, uh, marching on. We'll begin in verse number nine. First uh, Peter chapter two, verse number nine. You'll have to bear with me here. I think I'm just under the weather. There's something going around on the boat, and a lot of congestion. And I've been saving, trying to save my voice, and we'll see if it it lasts through this. I've been, uh, but First Peter chapter two. Uh, verse number nine says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul having your conversation honest amongst the Gentiles, that, whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much once again for this time and this hour, Lord, to come into your house amongst your people, Lord, to hear your word preached, Lord, to sing songs to you, to honor you in our songs and hymns and spiritual songs. I pray now, Lord, you'd be with me. Uh, guide my speech, Lord, help me uh, just to, um, Lord, make this all about you, Lord, to reveal these truths that you have given to me, Lord, and uh, may it be a blessing to those who hear it, uh, Lord, just uh, strengthen my voice in this hour, Lord, you know pray, amen. There's a, a famous quote by Ronald Reagan uh, that goes, um, the trouble with our liberal friends is not that they're ignorant, it's just that they know so much that isn't so. And sometimes people know things that really aren't, you know, they shouldn't be so sure about, you know, that they know facts that really aren't facts. Um, my, my little son, Jimmy, has, I don't know where he got this, but um, he now identifies pretty much anything that looks like a bug as an ant. So he knows the word ant. So now every, every fly, every moth, every beetle in this picture books is always an ant. No matter how much I like, no, Jimmy, this, this ant is a beetle. This ant is a butterfly. Ant, ant, it's always ant. And no matter how many times I correct him, it's always ant. So I took, uh, we, we went to the uh, Point to Find Zoo and Aquarium. And we were in the aquarium and they have giant Japanese spider crabs. These things are huge. And they can get up to 12 feet, like from leg tip to leg tip, 12 feet across. That's a huge crab. And of course, it's got one body, multiple legs. So Jimmy, ant, ant. It's like, no, this, this, 
Jimmy, this ant is called the crab. <laughs> you know? And one of these things, you know, that it's not that he's ignorant, it's just that he knows so much that he's so sure of himself. You know, every everything it's ant. He you know points that he's so sure of himself that that's an ant, because he knows one body segment and multiple legs and it moves, it's an ant. You know, he, he knows so much that isn't so. You know, and another thing that I love is um I don't know how he started this one either, but Something I think is even even more weird. But for the longest time, every car was a B. I don't know where he came up with this. We're, we're not sure where, but like, car B B, you know. And sure, just B. Now he's gotten a little better, and now it's bus. He can say bus. So now it's bus. Every car, truck, you know, going down the highway, semis going bus. That bus is called the car. That bus is a semi. You know, he he knows it's it's a bus, right? He knows something that isn't so. Right? Some people just get so much that they know that just really isn't. You know, and going through First Peter here, I think that uh, sometimes we, we think we, we know things that uh, maybe we don't. And in this aspect, I think it's we, we may know that we're farther along in our justification and our walk than what we really are. And I, I bring this up because I was, as I was studying this passage in First Peter and you know, if you take a look at your Bible, you'll see there's not many pages left after First Peter here. And I was going through this passage, and I'm trying to outline this and saying, what is the, the flow of the passage here? What is this, this paragraph here? What does it seem to point out? And I was like, well, we got, you know, he's encouraging us in the beginning, and then he's got some exhortations, some do's and some don'ts. And I was like, man, I feel like I've heard this before. You know, this flow, I've seen this pattern before. And then I look over at my previous sermons and, and notes, and I was like, man, it's just happened in First Peter chapter 1, it's the exact same thing. He's like, encourages us, then don't do this because of this. And I was like, man, this, this is really, you know, and we're, we're deep into the New Testament now in First Peter here. Um, and it's still these, these same truths. And we, you know, sometimes we think that we are, are farther along. And, you know, as much as I have to reiterate with my son that no, that ant is a crab, or no, that ant is a fly, or no, that bus is a car, that bus is a truck, you know, over and over and over again, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and uh, Christ as the Word incarnate, and God who is author, you know, in control of everything, continually tells us these same things over and over and over again, hoping that we will we will learn something along the way. Look in First uh, Peter chapter one, verse number nine in, in chapter two. Um, but ye are a chosen generation, a a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people. These wonderful words of encouragement that remind us of our place in God. And these, some of these words are very unique and only used in this verse in the entire Bible. Chosen generation, royal priesthood. These phrases are used in this verse, only this verse in the entire of the Bible, entirety of the Bible. But these phrases harken back to the Old Testament. And uh, as a reminder um, from earlier lesson about First Peter chapter one, Peter is preaching to New Testament churches just like the one right here that you and I are sitting are in as members here, you know, that are in Asia, but he is talking to Jews and Gentiles, and these uh, chosen generation, a holy nation, a peculiar people. While these may not be used anywhere else, but they have connotations that go back to the Old Testament, that go back to um, Exodus chapter 19, while Moses is up on Mount Sinai. And in Exodus 19, verse 6, uh, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So up on the Mount Sinai, Moses, right, having words from God, uses these same phrases. And so some of these, uh, the Jewish believers up in Turkey at this time would have been well familiar with this kind of language. And to think about the fact that now these, these Jewish people, and uh, if you've been in a Sunday school length of time and knowing from the conversations that Christ has with the Pharisees, they are very proud of their tradition. They're very proud of being Jews. They're very proud of their heritage, that we are the chosen ones from God. You know, we, Abraham is our father. And they have great confidence in that. And now, 
First Peter, a Jew himself, is using these words to talk about Gentiles. Now, this, if they uh, are new Christians or new believers, this would have been earth-shattering to them to think about that now, like, you've had your, you know, generations going back thousands of years to back to, you know, David and Moses and Abraham and the patriarchs and the matriarchs, and then all of this, that this is you. You are a chosen people. We are the Jews. We are special. We are chosen of God, you know. And now, here's Peter t saying those same words or similar words to everybody, Jews and Gentiles. Think about what that would have been, you know, that would have been like. And, you know, the, the Jews who were sitting in church and hearing this, they would have been, you know, uh, you know, that may have shocked them if they had been, you know, non issue to this. And the Gentiles who had been for so long excluded from being used of God in this certain way, they're like, now, you know, we're just like these guys. You know, they have, they are chosen by God. They, uh, in Romans chapter 11, remind me of this passage here. And Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 11, in verse number 16. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. If the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were it grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. And then uh, down in verse number 24. For if thou wert cut off of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So in here in the book, in Romans, right, Paul is kind of using a metaphor in horticulture where you take, you know, you break off some branches off of one tree and you put, uh, you know, if you have a, a wild olive or, you know, you can put a, another branch grafted on, you know, you tie that branch on to the broken branch and now that broken branch, which would have been dead, right, now gets nutrients through the xylem and phloem tubes from the roots up into those branches and it becomes alive again. And this is, you know, a metaphor of what's happening with the Gentiles, right? The, the Jews have been set aside. They, they were broken off of that branch so that you and I as Gentiles might be grafted into that branch and be partakers of this royal priesthood, this chosen generation, this holy nation. Now, we didn't have, you know, any, um, anything that we've done to deserve this. Um, it's all by the grace of God. You know, that we have been grafted in into this holy nation. We are also here in uh, verse number nine, a peculiar people. Now, I've met some peculiar people. I've worked with some peculiar people, but this is not the peculiar that uh, Peter is talking about here. This is a a special treasure. You know, that's something that's very precious, and we are precious to God. And in fact. Uh, we are so precious to God that he sent his only begotten son to die for us on the cross. That's how special we are to him. We, uh, a, another translation of a peculiar people is a purchased possession. And that just reminds us that we are purchased with the blood of Christ. Um, that we are his possession. We are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And Deuteronomy 14 There's a Deuteronomy 14, verse number 2 says, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord of God hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. And then uh, further back in Deuteronomy, or forward, depending on how you look at it, um, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse number 6, right, in the... For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. 
The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. These uh, these same um, phrases here, a chosen people, peculiar people, right? They were used of these Old Testament saints and of the Jewish people way back in, in the first five books of the law here are now being spoken of to us Gentiles. We are a purchased possession by God. It's not just the Jews anymore. It's available to all of us. So we see here, Peter is using these wonderful, wonderful phrases to give us encouragement. And uh, once again, you know, remember that these, uh, these churches that Peter is writing to in Asia at this time are going through persecution or are about to go through persecution, depending on when they get the letter and, uh, you know, when the persecution got to them from Rome, because they're pretty far out uh, from the seat of the empire. So they're being encouraged here. Um, by these, you know, these wonderful phrases here that, that Peter uses. And he, he begins this, this paragraph here with telling them these great things that they are now. They're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, peculiar people, right? And reminds them also that they were called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that uh, reminded me of... Uh, a phrase I, I often quote to my junior sailors. We have these, uh, you know, classrooms that the people like to hang out in. And, of course, you know, they like to turn off the lights and, and catch some sleep. So, you know, in uh, John 3, verse number 19, and most people stop at 16, but there's some good stuff afterwards. In John 3, I can't even get there myself. John 3, verse number 19, Christ says this, And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Right? They are called out of darkness into light. Right? They, that evilness that we used to do as unsaved, right? We are called out of that lifestyle, out of doing those things, into His marvelous light. We are to set aside all those things that we had done before and now turn unto Christ, right? And why are we doing that? Well, we're doing that because we are a holy nation, a peculiar people, right? Purchased possession, a royal priesthood, right? These living in darkness is not becoming unto somebody who's, you know, a royal priesthood or a holy nation, right? When you think about the priests in the Old Testament, you know, that would go in before God and that... They would have to be, you know, so holy and so devoted, right, that, you know, they'd have to, you know, these are the, the symbol, right, the go-between between, between man and God, these priests, and they have to offer sacrifice for themselves, or wash themselves. And, you know, just in case they forgot something or, you know, they, they weren't right enough, you know, they would have a rope tied to their legs so... The other people could drag out the body if God struck them dead, you know, because they were not holy enough to get into that place. Right? That's that's the kind of mindset that they these Jewish believers would have had to go in front of a, a holy God. And so, we as if we are a royal priesthood, we should have that mindset of being holy. Right? And in verse number ten, once again. Peter here is talking about these, these Gentile believers that you were not a people, but you're now the people of God. You didn't have mercy, but now you do have mercy, right? Once again, setting that, showing that historical distinction that no longer exists. These Gentile believers were not a people, right? You think about like there is a very small number of Jewish people in the world compared to the rest of the world population, Right? It's a very small percentage of the world's population. And everybody else is lumped together. 
Africa, Asia, South America, the United States, everybody else falls into that category. You know, all kinds of different creeds, colors, you know, all fall into Gentiles, right? Oh, I think I might be low on battery. Um, but everybody is lumped into the All right, there we go. Okay, everybody's lumped into that other category. Uh, thank you, Roman. Um, and you just have this small, little, tiny sliver of the world's population, you know? So they weren't, you know, they weren't anything special in the whole Old Testament, you know, which is two-thirds of your Bible right there. But now, you're the people of God. Now you've obtained mercy. In verse number 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. And when I was coming across those words, I was just thinking, you know, once again, um, and it's probably along with hopefully the same lines, you know, as, as Peter's thinking. And in Hebrews 11, right, verse number 10, Hebrews 11, verse number 10, uh, talking about Abraham and the patriarchs here, he looked for a city which have foundations, whose builder and maker is God, right? And then also at the, uh, the end of uh, chapter 11, verse number 38, talking about all the, the prophets um, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us, should not be made perfect. So, right, Abraham going through the desert, through wanderings, through all this, all this stuff, right, and it says in verse number 10 that he's looking for a building maker, his God, right? He's, he's just a pilgrim passing through this earth. Abraham was a very rich man, had lots of stuff. I mean, he had, he had enough servants to take on five, five kingdoms and win. He was a very rich man. But he did not consider himself to be part of this world. He did not consider himself like this was his home. He was just passing through, right? He did not have his treasures here on earth but laid up in heaven for him. He is a pilgrim and a wanderer. And strangers and pilgrims. We need to have that kind of a pilgrim mindset, a pilgrim attitude, right, that these these things that seem to snare us and trap us in this world, they need to be transient things. We need to be able to let them go. Um, you know, uh, that just, that just this, I mean, in the, in the end, right, this, you know, the, car, the kind of car you have, the clothes you wear, the house you live in, it's all not going to matter in light of eternity, right? What will matter is what you did with the gospel of Jesus Christ. What, do, what does matter, and what will matter in the future, right, is the word of God and the souls of men. Those things last for eternity. Everything else is just passing through, you know. So while it may seem like a long time and, you know, this, you know, the, the four score and ten, as the Bible says, years you get here and maybe a little bit more, you know, is just a small speck, just a drop of sand on the beach compared to the light of eternity, you know. And uh, it's, it's just, just a brief flash, you know, in, in James. Your life is a vapor. It's gone so short. And just these, these things that we often worry about, you know, are going to seem so small, you know, when we compare to the light of eternity and, and those things. We need to have our eyes set on God. And... You know, going back to my introduction, you know, these we have to be told these things over and over and over again, right? And uh, what did Abraham you know, have to be reminded of, right? He, he offered up 
thy son, thy only son, whom thou lovest, Isaac, right? And after he goes through that and offers up Isaac and God gives it back to him, right? It's no longer thine only son whom thou lovest. It's just thy son in that passage, right? Everything is laid at the feet of Christ, at the feet of God, everything, right? The, can you imagine waiting all that time? You know, I mean, he is 99 years old getting this sort of promise like, and to, that is the one, that is the promise from God, right? You're going to have a son. He's going to be the father of many nations. Wow. You know, molt as the stars in the sky. Okay. It's, it's, it's been 10 years. God, where's that son? It's been 15 years, God. Where's that son? It's 20 years. God, I'm not getting any younger here. You know, and then he finally gets this son. And then God says, I want you to sacrifice him. I, I don't know if I'm going to live another 25 years, God, to have another son. You know, and you, but he lays everything because he is looking for a building and a city whose maker is God. He is a pilgrim and a stranger on this world. Everything that he has is just transient. Everything is all about God. And then uh, in the New Testament, this, this same Peter, man, I love Peter, right? The storm happens on the Sea of Galilee, and they see this figure walking on the water. I think it's a ghost, and it's the Son of God walking on water. Peter says, if it's you, Lord, bid me come on the water. And he gets out on the boat, starts walking on water, and then all of a sudden, he takes his eyes off of God and looks on the waves, those things that are so transient, those things that pass, those white caps that seem so big at that moment, but they pass so fast. If you guys have ever been in a storm on the water, you know, it may seem, you know, sometimes those storms come up fast and they go away just as fast. And those waves seem really big, but they go by so fast. You know, they're, they hit the boat and they're gone. They hit, the, they come over the bow, Splash and they're gone. And there's drops of water now. You know, those things that seem so big, so immense, those storms that seemed incredible, right? They're transient. These, these things, right? So we as pilgrims and strangers need to have that kind of view. And once again, because we are a royal priesthood, right, we have to be ye holy, as uh, First Peter chapter 1, right, in, uh, I think it's uh, verse number 15, you know, just one chapter before. But as he which hath called you holy, which he hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Right? We are to abstain from fleshly lusts because we are a royal priesthood. We are to be holy. Fleshly lusts which war against the soul. And I looked this one up uh, and into the Greek here. And the idea of war here is the idea of a long campaign, an arduous journey. Right? That um, active service, active duty. All right? And uh, if you guys have been, you know, active duty, you know it's arduous, right? And this campaign, right, is a long battle. It's going to take some time. It won't be over in a, in a brief moment. These things that war against the soul, right? We are to abstain from these. That we need to keep in mind that we are to be holy because he which has called you is holy, Right, that we are the people of God. Verse number 10, right? The world has an idea of how people of God should behave, right? You and I as Christians shouldn't be frequenting the bars. We should not be using foul language, right? We shouldn't be quick to anger, right? The world knows these things of us, right? They, um, you know, these are things that, that, you know, Christians shouldn't do, Right? And we need to make sure that we go above and beyond 
of, of what the world thinks, you know, that there is a difference between us and them. Because these things war against our soul. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. And uh, this day of visitation is the day of a judgment, the visitation of God's wrath upon the people of the earth, right? That now they will slander you and call you all kinds of names, right? Because you are light to their darkness, right? You are salt, right? They don't like that. I heard a message one time, you know, and if, if you um, grew up in church or, you know, worked with youth groups, you know, went to maybe camp or whatever, you always know that if you bring, like, 50 different churches together, right, to camp, for summer camp, all of the bad kids who had never met each other will all find each other at camp, right? Because when you are doing something bad, right, if nobody else is doing bad, there's a stark contrast between you and what's good in this world. You need to drag somebody down to your level to make you feel better, right? You can't just sin by yourself. You have to have a buddy, right? If you are doing something illegal, you have to have a friend with you, right? One, to share the blame, and hopefully you two can run from the cops in different directions and distract them, right? But it makes you feel better, right? Because it's not just you sinning. It's now it's you and your friend, right? If you, you know, if you're, you know, a miscreant, juvenile, delinquent teenager, right? You can't just, you know, sneak a cigarette. You have to have, you know, somebody in the back of the school smoking cigarettes together, right? Because otherwise it's just you and you're just sitting and now you realize that you're the odd man out, that you are in the wrong. But if you have a friend with you that you can drag down to their level, now you have somebody else with you, right? And that's what Satan is going to do. He, Satan is the master liar, and he is going to war against our soul. Verse number 11, he is going to try and take us down to his level to ruin our testimony, to ruin our way of life, to crush whatever good thing is in him. Because the more holy we are, the more light we have, that scatters away the darkness, right? And that darkness, you know, I mean... There is so much darkness in this world, and they cannot stand. I'm, I'm convinced that's why there is such an attack on the home, on the family, on the churches, you know, because the world cannot stand to see a holy thing, because that just shows what a terrible thing that they are in, right? They, they have to make everything evil and wicked look normal, so they don't feel bad about their own sin. So they don't see how bad the destruction of the home and the family that they're doing. All of the, um, the, the stats that Brother Mark read on his Father's Day sermon about the broken homes and the, the high crime and the rates of alcoholism, depression, suicide, and jail. Um, you know, one of my, my favorite stats is the, the number one indicating factor between whether a kid goes to prison or college is the dad in the home. You know, so <clears throat> Satan has to try and break up the family through whatever means he can to make sure that those who are doing the right are smaller and smaller and smaller so the light does not shine as much. We have to be holy. There is a war against our soul, right? They're going to speak evil against us because they hate us, right? They, we shouldn't expect this world to coddle us to, to treat us good, right? If we are Christians, if we claim Christ, right? The word Christian is little Christ, right? What did they do to Christ? They didn't love him, right? He, it ends with a death on, on the cross for him. That's how the world viewed him, right? We, we should, and Christ told us to expect nothing less, right? If that's how they treated the master, how much will they treat the servant. There is a war going on. Now, they're going to speak evil of us, but when the day of judgment comes, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, 
glorify God, right? They will have no choice but to say, in the end, yes, I, I was a friend, I was a coworker of so-and-so, and I saw their good works, you know, and they will glorify God by giving you um, honor and glory that you will give to Christ, you know, for the good works, for your testimony, because of, of, of you, the lifestyle that you have lived. But that is only an option if we remain pure, if we remain holy, if we keep ourselves from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, if we keep ourselves uh, from, uh, if, you know, if we abstain from the appearance of sin, you know, if we abstain from idols and fornication and all these things in uh, 1 Thessalonians and, and Acts um, that we are warned to stay against, you know, if, if we don't have a difference, right, then our testimony is going to be like Lot, right? And whose righteous soul was vexed every day by being in Sodom and Gomorrah. You think about the testimony of Lot, right? He had, you know, he had good counsel and good instruction, right? And at the end of the day, he lost everything. And, you know, it was, it was him and his wife, and his four kids, and that's eight people, right? And how, how many did God say he would spare the entire city for? Ten people. If they would have just had two more people, if they would have, you know, had two more people, that entire city would have been saved. But that's not what Lot chose. He chose to hide who he was, to hide the, you know, the knowledge of God that he knew. And as a result, he lost his wife. He lost his kids. The entire city was destroyed. You know, and all because, you know, I, and I'm, I'm sure being in Sodom, right, there was a war against lost soul. Right? There was lust that, you know, fought a campaign, a long attack against his soul. And when the angels came in the day of judgment, right, and the day of visitation came for Lot, right, his, his sons-in-law thought that he was just mocking them because his lifestyle didn't show it. He was... He, that holiness that he had, the light and salt that he was called to be, he gave it all up. So I hope that uh, you and I will take heart and that as, as we remember and go through the Bible reading and, and see this, this same message over and over again, you know, that we are called to be different, whether it's the Old Testament and the illustration of separating the Jews from the Gentiles the sheep and the goats parables and, and the gospels and the epistles here calling us to be holy, right? To abstain from fleshly lusts, right? Um, because the day of visitation is coming. All right, but there's, you know, this message, you know, there's, you know, who are you, right? You're a chosen generation, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. Right? If you know Christ as your Savior, that's who you are. Well, what are you going to do about that knowledge? Are you going to throw it away like Lot did? Are you going to stand up and abstain from fleshly lusts and view yourself as strangers and pilgrims in this world, like a good example of Abraham? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you so much for this message. God, I just thank you for the testimony of your word, Lord, for these convictions, oh, Lord, that remind us. Uh, Lord, that we need to be holy. We need to be set apart. Lord, it, it may be difficult. It might be hard. It's going to be a lot of work, Lord, to be separate from this world, Lord. But the rewards will be so great, giving all of our crowns at your feet. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be changed, Lord, by this lesson and to live the truths of your word every day. Lord, help us to be lights and salt as we go out uh, from here today, Lord, and back to work. 
God, I pray that you'd help us to be different, Lord, from the world. Lord, give us the courage to stand for you like Daniel, like Abraham, and God, like your son, Jesus Christ. And God, we give you all the honor and glory and praise. In your son's precious name, I pray. Amen. All right. Let's see. We have a, let's see, missionary letter, Jeff Gross to Thailand. Uh, says, Dear Churches and Friends, Bible Baptist Church recently held a three-day Bible conference. During the conference, we had preaching, a men's and women's study, lots of good fellowship. There's excellent spirit throughout the conference. They're excellent for our young church. 